Hi, this is Michael Altos, and we are continuing our discussion of cardiac physiology, and this is recording part four. The next section of pathophysiology we're going to discuss is heart failure. There are different kinds of heart failure. Systolic heart failure is when the heart is unable to pump sufficiently to meet the body's metabolic needs. Nowadays, it's being called heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, usually when the ejection fraction is below 40%. Patients with systolic heart failure may develop congestion, which means buildup of blood volume behind the failing ventricle. Patients who have left-sided failure usually have symptoms in the lungs because the lungs are behind the left ventricle. This can happen a lot in patients with coronary artery disease who have ischemic injury to their ventricular myocytes, but it can also happen with patients who have viral disease or some toxins if they have severe uncontrolled hypertension, valvular disease, arrhythmias, or pericardial disease. Symptoms of left-sided heart failure include fatigue, dyspnea, again, that's shortness of breath, because they don't have enough oxygenation. They can get pulmonary venous congestion or pulmonary edema. They can develop rals or crackles and wheezing or orthopnea, which is dyspnea when lying flat, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, which is when they wake up from sleep gasping for air. And all of these are due to transmitting this excess blood volume back to the pulmonary system. Patients can also develop right-sided systolic heart failure, and this is more likely to affect the systemic or peripheral tissues because they are the tissues behind the right ventricle. The most common cause of right heart failure is left heart failure. Since the right heart is behind the left heart, eventually left heart failure will back up and overload the right heart, causing it to fail. But other causes of heart failure on the right side include lung disease or pulmonary hypertension. Patients can have jugular venous distension. You can see how this patient is sitting up and yet his jugular vein is popping out. They can have peripheral edema, swollen limbs, ascites, which is swelling in the abdomen and enlargement of the liver. <clears throat> patients can go into acute decompensated heart failure, which is an exacerbation of chronic heart failure. Usually this happens when they have another illness, like they have pneumonia, and that makes their heart failure get worse. Or they have an MI or an arrhythmia, or their hypertension gets out of control, or they get fluid overloaded. These are things that tip their heart failure over the edge and puts them into decompensated heart failure. So that's all systolic heart failure. Patients can also have diastolic heart failure, and we spoke very briefly before about diastolic function being defined as the ability of the heart to relax. So diastolic heart failure is when the heart is unable to normally relax. And nowadays it's being called heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. These patients may have a normal ejection fraction on echocardiogram, but they can still be quite sick. Diastolic failure can be caused by hypertension, coronary disease, hypertroph hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, valvular disease, and pericardial disease. In these patients, the left ventricular end diastolic pressure is elevated. And again, that's because the heart can't relax enough to accommodate all of the venous return that's coming into it. These elevated pressures get transmitted to the left atrium and then to the pulmonary vasculature. Now, these patients may have none of the signs or symptoms that we described above, especially at rest, but they're very sensitive to the system being messed up. And if they have increased heart rate, they can go into flash, flash pulmonary edema, for example. Patients can have one or both of systolic and diastolic heart failure. They're not exclusive from each other. Here are some volume pressure curves showing the difference between systolic and diastolic function. In a patient with systolic dysfunction, so here's the normal change in pressure and volume, Patients with systolic function, so first of all, you can see our volumes are overall much higher. Even at the end of systole, look how much more volume is in this ventricle compared to this one. So this ventricle is chronically overloaded. The ejection fraction is a little bit lower. 
compare that to diastolic, diastolic function. In this case, we are unable to fill the heart as full as before because of that inability to relax and a little bit of increased pressures compared to the normal. Patients with heart failure could have a normal cardiac output at rest, but their problem is that they can't increase their cardiac output and their oxygen delivery when it's necessary, when their demand increases from exercise or stress. We call this having a low cardiac reserve. And there are a couple different ways of classifying heart disease or heart failure. The New York Heart Association has a functional classification ranging from class one, which is really very mild or no limitation at all, all the way to class four, where any physical activity at all brings discomfort and they may even have some symptoms at rest. The ACC AHA has stages of heart failure going from stage A where they're just really pre-heart failure all the way down to stage D where their disease is so advanced they need to be in the hospital and may need a heart transplant or a ventricular assist device or something like that. What does the body do in the case of heart failure in order to compensate and try to increase delivery of oxygen to the various tissues. Well, first we know that preload, increased preload increases cardiac output to a point. Since these patients have a reduced ejection fraction from their systolic heart failure, if we can increase their end diastolic volume, we can increase their ventricular size. Increased preload causes increased contractility. That's the Frank Starling law that we talked about earlier. But we also know that, in, especially in patients with heart failure, too much ventricular dilatation will actually lead them to heart failure. Also, they can get regurgitation of their aortic, of their atrial ventricular valves. And as the heart muscles start to distend, there's release of a substance called BNP, which is beta natriuretic peptide. And sometimes people will examine the, the serum for a BNP level which could be an indication of heart failure. Patients who have LV dysfunction will develop increased catecholamine levels and increased sympathetic tone in an attempt to increase heart rate and contractility. But if this happens chronically, then their catecholamine receptors start to get desensitized and their body will actually downregulate them. Patients will also deplete their catecholamine stores. And so these are patients who could acutely decompensate when you induce anesthesia and take away all of that sympathetic drive that's been keeping them going day after day. The body will also try to redistribute blood flow preferentially to the heart and the brain, the two most important organs. As a result, you may see decreased perfusion to other important organs like the kidneys. This leads to activation of the renin angiotensin system and causes sodium retention and edema. Patients who have increased left ventricular afterload will have worsening of their systolic function, and this can lead to ventricular hypertrophy. If patients have volume overload due to myocardial infarction or cardiomyopathy, this causes increased wall stress during diastole, and the heart will start to grow larger, not thicker, and we call this eccentric, sorry, over here, we call this eccentric hypertrophy, where the the heart is starting to dilate. They can also respond to pressure overload in the case of hypertension or aortic stenosis, and this leads to increased wall stress during systole and, and, con, and what we call a concentric hypertrophy. The heart wall grows thicker, but this reduces the size of the ventricular cavity and can lead to diastolic dysfunction, where the heart's unable to relax because it's got this bulky, thick cavity. And this diagram just compares eccentric and concentric hypertrophy with what we call physiologic hypertrophy. This is an athletic heart where the heart has been working hard in a healthy way and the heart muscle has gotten a little bit thicker and the heart's gotten a little bit bigger, but all of these changes work to improve the efficiency and the pumping of the heart. Patients who have heart failure may be treated with beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin II receptor blockers, aldosterone antagonists, vasodilators, diuretics, and inotropes, all in the attempt to optimize the patient 
the patient's oxygen delivery in the setting of heart failure. How do we approach patients with heart failure for anesthesia? In general, we want these patients to take most of their home medications, especially their beta blockers. Some people will have them stop their diuretics, and especially ACE inhibitors and angiotensin II receptor blockers, because these drugs can lead to intraoperative hypotension. We want to review their recent EKG if they have one, make sure their electrolytes are normal, check renal function, and see their latest echocardiogram so we know the severity of their heart failure. In these patients, we want to remember that fluid overload can worsen their heart failure. And so we can't just give them fluid every time their blood pressure drops, assuming that they're hypovolemic. Because if they're not hypovolemic, we can actually make their heart failure worse. For this reason, a lot of patients with severe heart failure should have an intraarterial catheter and perhaps even consider a PA catheter or a TEE probe in order to assess the ventricular filling and the wall motion as well as possible. Patients with significant heart failure should not be exposed to significant drops in preload or afterload. We want to be careful with any vasodilating anesthetic agents like propofol or inhalational agents, and be careful with our sympathomimetic drugs. One related topic I'd like to cover is called hypertrophic, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Some people call it hokum. This is one of the most common genetic cardiovascular diseases. The diagram shows that compared to a normal heart, these patients have hypertrophy of the muscle in the left ventricular septum and in the anterolateral free wall. We know that muscle hypertrophy can lead to diastolic dysfunction. They also have what's called systolic anterior movement of the mitral valve. If we look closely, here's the mitral valve right here. And normally when blood is ejected out into the aorta, it goes past this mitral valve leaflet easily. As this wall gets thickened, sometimes when the heart goes through, it catches, sometimes when the blood goes, goes through, it catches this anterior uh, leaflet of the mitral valve and it pulls in obstructing flow of blood out the aorta. That's why it's called obstructive cardiomyopathy. These patients can also develop mitral regurgitation and during systole blood is obstructed from going out the LV outflow tract. These patients can have sudden death due to arrhythmias and it's one of the common reasons that otherwise healthy looking athletes sometimes die from sudden cardiac death during athletics. In these patients, we want to avoid anything that worsens the obstruction. So what makes this obstruction worse? Well, it turns out increased catecholamines, like that increased contractility, make it worse. If their preload is low, so the ventricle is relatively empty, that can be a problem. And if afterload is low, that can also be a problem. Many patients should be monitored with an arterial line or a TEE during major anesthetic cases. We certainly want to keep them in sinus rhythm. And we want to keep their heart rate on the lower side, which makes phenylephrine an ideal choice for treating hypertension. I also want to briefly review the concept of an intra-aortic balloon pump. This pump is a form of mechanical circulatory support, which is used in all sorts of cases, like cardiogenic shock, patients who can't wean from cardiopulmonary bypass. This device is placed usually through the femoral or sometimes the brachial artery, and it's advanced on a catheter until it's in the aorta. The large balloon inflates during diastole in order to create what they call an augmented diastolic pressure and this increases coronary perfusion because the diastolic pressure in this portion of the aorta is extra high. And during diastole, the coronary arteries are well perfused. Of course, it needs to deflate during systole so blood can pump out the aorta and to the rest of the body.
We call this systolic unloading. And in these patients, they'll have increased cardiac output and reduced myocardial oxygen demand. The intraaortic balloon plump has to be perfectly synchronized because we certainly wouldn't want it to inflate during systole, and it won't do any good if it doesn't inflate during diastole. So the, the balloon pump is triggered by synchronizing its inflation and deflation, either with the EKG waveform or an arterial pressure waveform. And so here you can see this is a regular beat, systole, high pressure, and then diastole, low pressure. Then here's their next pump, systole, high pressure, and then diastole, as the pressure starts to come down, the balloon is triggered and it inflates, and look how high the aortic pressures are during diastole. This is augmented diastolic pressure and it's perfusing the coronary, and then it releases in before the next pump, before the next systole, and we call this an assisted end diastolic pressure. You can see an extra low pressure here, making the next systole easier for the heart to generate. That's it for this section. Please let me know if you have any questions, and we'll continue with the next recording. See you there.